In this video, we focus on one very specific type of clause, and that is an exemption clause. An exemption clause is a term of a contract that tries to do one of two things. It will either try to limit liability to a set financial amount, or alternatively, it will try to exclude liability for certain types of loss, so property damage or consequential loss and so on. You can have them mixed together, but they ultimately do boil down into one of those two things, a limitation or an exclusion. So what we're going to look at, apart from defining them terms in a bit more detail, is what governs the enforceability of an exemption clause. As you can imagine that they are quite onerous things to sign up to, so they are subject to certain rules that the drafter must follow to ensure that they are enforceable. And they must make sure that they're incorporated into the agreement. We'll talk about the red hand rule from Lord Denning. They must be validly constructed. So if you're trying to exclude loss for, say, negligence, does it say the word negligence in the clause itself or something that could include negligence? And we'll look at how those terms are to be constructed against the drafter as well. And then finally, we're going to look at the statutory controls that govern exemption clauses under the Unfair Contract Terms Act, looking at that reasonableness test and Schedule 2 and all of that good stuff. Looking then at exemption clauses, which are one of the favourite things of the contract drafter, one of the things that they have in their arsenal. So when we look at an exemption clause, we're going to start by looking at what they do, what they seek to limit or what they seek to exclude. We will then move on to look at how the law governs them and what they have to do to be enforceable. So by looking at how do they become incorporated into the contractual agreement, how are they to be constructed, how are they to be drafted, and then lastly, what are the statutory rules that govern them, with specific emphasis on the Unfair Contract Terms Act of 1977. So what exactly is an exemption clause then? Well, quite straightforward, it's an express term of the contract that seeks to do one of two things. It will either seek to limit one party's liability or exclude liability for some sort of loss. So we've got a few examples on the screen here. It could take the form of a cap on liability. So a cap on one party's liability in damages and whatever else to a set fiscal amount. And we would call that a limitation clause. And that would be a very common thing to see in quite a lot of commercial contracts where one party limits their liability to a percentage of the original contract price. So if you're installing, for instance, a computer software system, the party installing it might want to limit their liability to a set financial amount, to a set financial cap to give them the ability to limit their exposure, to limit the risk of taking on that contract. And that is the commercial purpose of that type of provision. The other type of exemption clause then is a exclusion of liability. So excluding liability for one specific type of loss. And you would very often see this in the termination provisions of a commercial contract, whereby one party will exclude liability on termination for the other party's loss of profit for their loss of revenue, for their loss of opportunity, and so on. You would very often see those bullet pointed out in a long list of exclusions, liability exclusions. So collectively, we call those types of clauses exemption clauses. The point is, the party that seeks to rely upon an exemption clause has to prove that it is enforceable, or moreover, the clause itself has to be enforceable for that party to be able to rely upon it. And when we investigate the enforceability of an exemption clause, the traditional analysis is to break it down into the three points that you can see on screen. So first of all, by examining whether or not that exemption clause actually was incorporated as part of the contractual agreement. And quite often people will try to slip these things in and whether or not in slipping it in, it is part of the contract is a question that you would have to answer. And we've got quite a lot of case law on that particular point. You then have to go on, so assuming that the exemption clause is part of the contract, you then have to go on to consider, has it been constructed correctly? Has the drafter actually covered the loss that the party is seeking to limit or seeking to exclude? And again, we will look at how you interpret the provisions of an exemption clause when we consider the construction. And then lastly, 
it then has to abide by the statutory rules. So there are certain types of losses that you simply cannot limit or you simply cannot exclude. For example, you cannot exclude liability for death or personal injury caused by your own negligence. And we're going to look at the relevant provisions of the Unfair Contract Terms Act when it comes to that particular facet and the reasonableness test that covers most other instances. So to give ourselves some perspective on what we've just discussed, we're going to be breaking down in the remainder of this video the three things that you must know to understand whether or not an exemption clause is enforceable. So starting with incorporation, we're going to look at the rules of signature, notice and course of dealings and whether or not through those mechanisms an exemption clause has validly been incorporated into the agreement. The rules that we look at under that part of the video, they apply to any form of express term of contract, not just an exemption clause, any other express terms. They also have to be incorporated correctly. So all of the rules we look at, first of all, with respect to incorporation, apply to all other forms of express term. We then look at construction, so analysing what exactly does this exemption clause say? Is it wide enough to cover the loss that the drafter envisaged? And what happens if it's too wide? And we'll cover all of those questions. And then lastly, as we said previously, looking at the statutory controls under the Unfair Contract Terms Act of 1977, analysing when it would be reasonable for a party to include such an onerous provision and whether or not it falls foul of that test of reasonableness. And then we will also look at certain things that you simply cannot do under the Unfair Contract Terms Act, such as limiting liability for death or personal injury caused by your own negligence. Looking then at incorporation, first of all. So what we mean by this is quite simply, is the exemption clause actually part of the contract? Was it part of the offer that was made that was subsequently accepted forming the contractual agreement? So that is what we're talking about here. And please don't lose sight of that. People tend to get lost in the facts here, but that's ultimately what we're considering first of all. Has it validly been incorporated as part of the contractual agreement? So there are three different ways in which incorporation can take place. We're going to look at each of them in quite a bit of detail. The first of which is incorporation by signature. So if it says something in writing and it has been signed by the other party, there's an assumption there that they've agreed to it because they've incorporated the terms by signing it. And we'll look at the case of Ella Strange for that. We will also look at incorporation by notice and then on to incorporation by a regular and consistent course of dealings. Again, all three of these are valid mechanisms in which an exemption clause can be incorporated as part of a contractual agreement. But as we say, these rules also apply to any other form of express term of contract. So that could be a term to do with the quality of goods that you're purchasing or the colour of the goods that you're purchasing. Those other express terms can also be incorporated by these mechanisms. So it's important to know them not just from an exemption clause point of view, but also from express term of contract point of view. So starting then with incorporation via signature. So of the three mechanisms that we're about to cover, this one is probably the most straightforward. And it sets out that if a written contract is drafted and that written contract contains an exemption clause and it is subsequently signed by the other party, it does not matter whether or not they read that exemption clause. It does not matter whether or not they understood it. If they sign up to it, it is incorporated as part of the agreement. So the logic is it gives certainty to everyone. So you should not have signed it. If you have signed it, you are deemed to have read it, you're deemed to have understood it, and the exemption clause is incorporated. It gives certainty to everyone. And the case that we have for that is an interesting one of Ella Strange and Grew Cobb, and that's what our little cartoon is for on the slide. So in this particular case, Grew Cobb was the seller of a vending machine which dispatched cigarettes. And as part of the contract of sale for that vending machine, it was again back in 1934, so it was under the Sale of Goods Act of 1893, there was an implied term within that contract that it would be fit for purpose. But within the express terms of the agreement was our exemption clause, and it excluded liability and it excluded that implied term that the vending machine would be fit for purpose. So therefore, there was no term included that it would be fit for its purpose. 
and when it later turned out that the vending machine didn't work, Mrs. Elastrange sued the seller for breach of contract, but she was ultimately unsuccessful because there was an exemption clause within her contract that set out that the implied term as to fitness for purpose was excluded and therefore she had no case against the seller when the vending machine turned out not to be fit for purpose. As a little bit of interesting trivia on this case, Gru Cobb, who was the seller of the vending machine, was represented by a young barrister by the name of Tom Denning, who later went on to become the famous Lord Denning. So he was on for the seller in this particular case, and he was able to successfully argue that the exemption clause was incorporated by Mrs. Ella Strange signing it, even though she didn't read it. But the point was, Tom Denning, even though he was on for the successful party, was shocked by the decision, shocked by his own brilliance. And ultimately, it set him on a bit of a path as the protector of the consumer. And his actions in the subsequent decades after the Second World War ultimately led to a lot more consumer protection. And again, one might say even led to the likes of the Unfair Contract Terms Act that we have um, from 1977 that we will cover later. So as an interesting bit of trivia there, the person that represented the successful party ultimately went on to become Lord Denning, who ultimately went to change things for the consumer and for the better. Looking then at our second mechanism of incorporation, and that is incorporation via notice, or moreover, incorporation via reasonable notice. So the legal principle here is, is that the party seeking to rely upon the exemption clause must have taken reasonable steps to bring it to the attention of the other party. The key distinction to make here is that it must be reasonable steps, not actual notice. So the party seeking to rely upon the clause does not have to prove that the other party had actual notice of it, that they actually read it and that they actually knew it was there. They just have to prove, which is a much lower threshold, that they took reasonable steps to bring it to their attention. Because they took reasonable steps to bring it to their attention, it was up to the other party to actually read it. And again, that's where the law draws the line. So that's specific legal principle. We don't derive it from one particular case, but rather we derive it from a series of cases. So by looking at these cases and their facts and the principles that we get out of those facts, that's what points us towards that part of law, that the party seeking to rely upon the exemption clause must have taken reasonable steps to bring it to the attention of the other party. So the first case then is, is Henderson and Arthur. So in this particular case, it was all to do with an individual, a passenger, who purchased a ticket to go from one port to the other, Dublin to Whitehaven, I think it was. And on the reverse side of that ticket, it set out that the ferry company would not be liable for any loss of luggage or anything else for that matter. It was quite a broad sweeping exemption clause or an exclusion clause, a specific type of exemption. So you can probably guess what happened. Mr. Henderson got on the boat and the thing sunk and he lost his luggage. He sued the ferry company for the return of his luggage or the damages thereof. And ultimately he was successful. He was successful because the exemption clause was on the back of the ticket and there was nothing on the front of them that would have drawn his attention to that. So again, by printing something on the back, again, they were hiding it away. They did not take reasonable steps to bring it to his attention. Again, the answer may have been very different if there was something on the front of it which said, please turn over, there is an exemption clause. Again, a big red hand pointing towards it. The answer probably would have been different there because they would have taken reasonable steps to bring it to his attention. So again, you have to look at where First of all, the exemption clause is actually placed. Then you can move on to consider the next key case that we have here, and that is Sugar and LMS Railway. Very similar facts. It was all to do with the ticket, and on one part of the ticket, it had an exemption clause. 
but in that case there was a stamp or there was something written over the exemption clause that meant it was illegible. So again, similar to Henderson and Stevenson, the court held that that clause was not enforceable because it had the stamp over it and it could not be read. So therefore, the person seeking to rely upon it, in this case, the railway firm, ultimately could not enforce it and they could not rely upon that exemption clause. You then have to go on to consider whether or not the document that contains the exemption clause is actually a contract document or a mere receipt. So something that came after the contract had formed. And again, you can imagine why that, in that circumstance, the term would not be part of the contract because it came after the contract was formed. That falls outside the rules that we've considered up to this point. So the case that we have for a receipt versus a contract document is Chapleton and Barry, a rather bizarre case. So in this particular one, Mr. Chapleton was going to rent out a deck chair from Barry Urban District Council, so a local authority. He went up and paid for the deck chair and got a receipt for that or got a ticket back for that, put it in his pocket and went down to sit on the deck chair. Whatever happens, the thing must have collapsed and he injured himself as a result of sitting on the deck chair. He opened up the receipt in his pocket and funnily enough, there was a big exemption clause in the back of it that Barry Urban District Council accept no liability for any loss suffered or injury suffered by you as a result of using our deck chairs. Ultimately, his case against the council succeeded because it was held that the exemption clause was not part of the contract. They didn't even have to consider the wording of it. It was not part of the contract itself. It was not part of the contract because it was not validly incorporated and it was not validly incorporated because it came after the contract had already formed, after his offer of the money was already accepted by the cashier. Then the exemption clause was introduced via the receipt. So again, looking at the timing is very important and the case that we have for that is Chapleton and Barry. And then finally, a principle that we've already considered in a previous video, and that is whether or not the exemption clause is an unexpected one. So something that is not run of the mill for that particular type of contract or one that is particularly onerous by the reasonable standard. And the case that we have for that is Thornton and Shulian Parking, and that's what we have the red hand for. And that's another Lord Denning case where he set out that if a clause is onerous, if it is unusual, if it is unexpected, then there must be a red hand pointing it out. It must be circled in red ink. And that is what the party seeking to rely upon it must do if they want to have it validly incorporated. So again, that's the rule in Thornton and Shulian Parking. We looked at another case that is very similar to that, and that was the Interphoto and Stiletto case back when we considered express clauses in a previous video. So the point is, you have to consider all of these different principles together to understand what it means for a party to take reasonable steps to bring a clause to the attention of the other party. And only in doing so, can that clause ever become incorporated. Moving on then to our final mechanism, and that is incorporation of an exemption clause or any other express term via a course of dealings. So the important thing to remember about this one is that the course of dealings, so all of those transactions between the parties, they must be regular. So again, that's one adjective and they must be consistent, the other key adjective here. And if you don't have both of those, then this mechanism will not work. So in trying to invoke this rule, then you have to picture the scene. So two parties are selling widgets, you know, so selling coal, for instance, to one another, so a supply agreement. And for years and years and years, they exchange contracts, they exchange contracts, and it always has an exemption clause within it. And everybody's fine with that. But for whatever reason, something happens and on one day of the month, the contract is not exchanged. In that particular circumstance, there is the possibility that the courts might try to imply that term into the agreement between the parties because of their regular and consistent course of dealings. So what you have to do and where the skill of the lawyer is in this one is ultimately determining what is regular and what is consistent. So we've got a couple of cases for that, that the specific facts are not that important. It's more to look at the number and the volume of transactions that we're describing. 
So in Hollier and Rambler Motors, we've got three contracts exchanged over a five year period. And you can probably imagine where the court went on that one. That was not regular enough. It was not regular enough to establish any sort of consistency between the parties. And contrasting that, we have the Harry Kendall case, where the parties very regularly worked with one another. So in that particular case, it was three contracts per month for three years, and the courts had no problem in that case implying that term into the agreement, even though they had left it out in the problem case. So as I say, the skill of the lawyer is trying to understand where your facts fit into those two extremes. So on one end, we have the Hollier case, where there was no regular and consistent course of dealings. But on the other end, we have the three per month for three years and the case of Harry Kendall. Most cases that you will deal with will probably fall somewhere in the middle, and that is a gray area. And that would be up to you to advocate which side that you think that falls on. If I was you and I was advising a client on that, I would always make sure to say that there is no definite answer to this. Only a Sith works in absolutes, um, and that applies here specifically. So always do have that in mind that this one is not as black and white as the others. So do take that in mind moving forward. So assuming then that your exemption clause has been validly incorporated into the agreement, so by signature, by notice, or by a regular and consistent course of dealings, you then have to go on to consider the actual wording of the exemption clause. And that's what we mean by considering its construction. So has the clause been constructed in the proper way to cover the loss which it seeks to exclude or it seeks to limit? So that's what we mean by construction. So the general rule when it comes to interpreting contracts or to construct a contract is to give the terms of it their ordinary and natural meaning. So it is as plain as that. When you see a word in a contract, you try to read it and you try to interpret it by giving it its ordinary and natural meaning. You will quite often see judges referring to the Oxford English Dictionary definition of a term, and that's what they're trying to do there. What does that term actually mean? What is its ordinary and natural meaning? And you know, 90% of the time, by applying that general rule, that will get you to the answer. Is it very clear or not what the exclusion actually means? So to give you an example, if you have an insurance contract and it sets out, if there are too many passengers in the vehicle, so if it's a five person car and you have six or more people in that vehicle and you have an accident, you will not be insured. Your insurance policy will be null and void. So that's an exemption clause. It's excluding their liability in the event that something happens. And by setting it out in an express term in that way, so six or more people, that's very clear in what they're doing. Giving that term its ordinary and natural meaning, you know exactly when the exemption kicks in. But what happens though, if you use a word that is not as clear as that, or a turn of phrase that is not as clear as that? What if you say, if you travel in the vehicle with an excess load in it, that the insurance will be void if you have an accident? So again, what does load mean whenever you're talking about a vehicle? Does that mean things in the boot? Does that mean passengers? It's an ambiguous term. And that's what takes us on to our next bullet point here. And that's what happens when you have an ambiguous term. And we will look at the facts that I just recited in a little bit. It's one of these cases coming up. So when you have an ambiguous term within a contract, the courts will tend to invoke the doctrine of contra preferentum. It is quite simply construing the document against the party that seeks to rely upon it. So contra meaning against, proferentum meaning against the proferor or the person that seeks to rely upon the term, which is usually the party that drafted the document. So in the event that something can be read one of two ways, you read it in the way that is more favorable to the party that didn't draft it, which is another way of looking at what that term means. So to bring this full circle and to use the facts that we looked at previously of traveling in a vehicle with an excess load, and what does that mean, that ambiguous term and the exclusion clause that was linked to it? That's the facts of Houghton and Trafalgar insurance. So Mr. Houghton was driving in his vehicle 
and he had too many passengers in it. So six people in a five person car. And as a term of his insurance policy, an exclusion term, it set out if you travel in the vehicle with an excess load and you have an accident, you're not covered. We have excluded our liability for that. And he went to the court and argued that the word load isn't anything to do with passengers. And the court, when trying to give it its ordinary and natural meaning, they found that it was an ambiguous term. So they were faced with how do we actually interpret this? And they interpreted the term contra preferentum. So they interpreted the term against the insurer. They interpreted it against Trafalgar Insurance. And they held that load did not mean passengers. You could read that both ways, but they held that the word load did not mean passengers. It was not wide enough to include that. And therefore, the insurance policy had to pay out to Mr. Houghton, even though he had too many people in the vehicle. It was not clear enough. It was construed contra preferentum and the insurers were liable. So the reason that the court used and invoked that rule of contra preferentum in such a rigorous way was because the exclusion term that they were talking about or concerned with was a proper exclusion clause. It was not simply a clause that sought to limit liability to a certain amount. So the payout is going to be 50% of what it otherwise would be, you know, limiting the payout. It was excluding it altogether. And when it comes to exclusion clauses, the courts use that rule of contra preferentum very rigorously, much more so than when it is a mere limitation clause. Such was the case in Eels Craig fishing and Malvern fishing, which I will let you go and have a look at just to see how the facts of that case contrast with the facts of Trafalgar insurance. The fact that the term was a mere limitation, but again, it was ambiguous. And how do the courts ultimately go on to interpret those? So in terms of how far we've come, we've discussed the incorporation of an exemption clause and we understand the rules that make an exemption clause part of the contract. We then moved on to consider the drafting of the clause. So by looking at its plain and ordinary meaning, does it actually limit liability or does it actually exclude liability? What happens if the wording is ambiguous and how will that be interpreted? We're now at the third and final hurdle, and that is whether or not the exemption clause, if it's all drafted correctly and properly incorporated, is actually lawful. And the point is that Parliament has intervened and stepped on the toes of our contractual freedom to contract on whatever terms we want. And they have put in place guidelines that ultimately regulate our ability to contract, as I say, on whatever terms we want. The line is drawn between two different types of contract. And the first of those is business to business agreements, which we are going to focus on in this video. And on the other side of the fence, the business to consumer agreements. So there's a line in the sand there and they are dealt with under two separate pieces of legislation. Business to business agreements are regulated by the Unfair Contract Terms Act and consumer contracts are dealt with under the Consumer Rights Act. So as I say, we're only going to be dealing here with the Unfair Contract Terms Act or UCTA, as I'll be pronouncing it throughout the remainder of this video. But do be aware that there is a slightly separate system in place that protects consumers. So when you type UCTA 1977 into Google after you've watched this video, you will find that the first link is legislation.gov.uk. That will let you go and read the entirety of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. But before you rush off to do that, let's just consider the preamble, because I think it sets out in a quite a nice little concise way exactly what this piece of law is all about. So I'm going to read it out. So it's an act to impose limits on the extent to which liability for breach of contract or for negligence or for breach of duty can be avoided by means of a contract term or otherwise. So I've paraphrased that slightly, but it does what it says on the tin. It is an act to limit the ability of the parties to contractually limit their obligations towards one another or to limit their liability towards one another for breach of contract, for negligence or breach of some other duty. And that's what it's all about here. And it achieves that purpose by two different mechanisms. 
The first of which is to make certain types of clause illegal. So again, unlawful, you cannot use them. If you do use them, they will be unenforceable. And to make other types of clause subject to a test of reasonableness. So whether or not looking at the circumstances, and again, the law describes those circumstances and we'll look at those in detail. So with those circumstances in mind, was it reasonable for that contract term to be included? And depending on the answer of that question will dictate whether or not it is enforceable. So we're going to look at all of this in quite a bit of detail. Being the stand up guy that I am, I have included a little table here which summarizes the key provisions of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. So this is the first mechanism that we're talking about. Certain types of clauses will be unlawful and I've summarized those in this table. So a clause of a contract that seeks to limit liability for death or personal injury caused by someone's negligence is unlawful. You cannot do that. If you include such a term within a contract under section two, subsection one of UCTA, it will be unenforceable. So you don't put it in there in the first place. If you do try to put it in, the courts will strike it out. So again, that's an example of a type of clause that is unenforceable. Another one is the statutory implied term under the Seal of Goods Act as to title. So there's an implied term that we talked about whenever we looked at that in our previous video that implies that a seller has good title to sell the object or to sell the goods. And again, you cannot contract out of that. You cannot pass off liability as to title. And again, that is set out under Section 6, Subsection 1, Subsection A. But those are the only two that are ultimately going to be voided if they are included. And they are the only two that fall foul of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. The other terms are all subject to what's known as a test of reasonableness. And we're going to look at that test of reasonableness in the next slide. But ultimately, for losses that are not personal injury or death, which result due to negligence, you can limit your liability for those. So if I'm a plumber, for example, I might write into my terms and conditions that if by my negligence, I put in a faulty pipe and it floods your house, causing you property damage, I am excluding all of my liability for that. Or I'm limiting my liability to you know, a set financial amount, 500 quid or whatever it may be. You can do that as long as in the circumstances, it is reasonable to do so. So we're going to look at what those circumstances are as well, because you have to look at those in conjunction with the test of reasonableness. The other types of term then, so a breach of the statutory implied term as to quality. So again, you can effectively contract out of that as long as it is reasonable to do so. So again, I might write into my contract if I'm a supplier that I am not liable for the state of the goods that I provide you. Why would you ever sign up to that if you were the purchaser? But again, in theory, I could do it as long as it was reasonable to do so. And then finally, for any other generic breach of contract. So this has nothing to do with the implied terms as to title or quality. This is to do with all of the other terms of the contract, both express and implied. And the point is that there's a bit of a fork in the road here. So if the contract has been freely negotiated between the parties, then OCTA doesn't apply and you are free to limit liability or exclude liability for whatever you want. So if the contract has been negotiated, the rules and the reasonableness test under OCTA don't apply. But if you are negotiating on standard forms of contract, so again, a standard sale and purchase agreement, it will be caught by the rules of OCTA. And OCTA sets out that liability exclusions and limiting your liability on standard terms is subject again to that test of reasonableness. So as I say, hopefully that little summary table, you know, hits the nail on the head and gives you a good overview of what OCTA entails. We're now about to move on to consider the test of reasonableness. The test of reasonableness then is set out under section 11, subsection one of OCTA. And it is an amicable piece of circular logic. So it basically sets out that the reasonableness test is something that takes into account whether or not it is fair and reasonable for a term to be included. But it goes a wee bit further than that. 
It sets out that when construing whether or not something is fair and reasonable, you have to give due regard to the circumstances which were or ought to have been reasonably known or to be in the contemplation of the parties at the time they entered into the contract. Bit of a mouthful that, but it really does boil down to this. So looking at it in the wider circumstances, to the reasonable person, was it reasonable for that term to be included? You know, would the fair-minded, hypothetical individual, the man who takes his magazines home in the evening, the man at the back of the Clapham omnibus, whatever test that you want to use, would that hypothetical person have thought it was reasonable in the circumstances for that term to have been included? So what Parliament did back when this Act was passed was that they gave us a schedule of things that should be taken into account when considering those circumstances. And those matters are set out in Schedule 2 of UCTA. And we're now about to consider what those factors are. So what are the factors that you would take into account when considering whether or not an exemption clause was reasonable in the circumstances? The guideline factors then under Schedule 2 are set out on screen and there are five of them. So before we look at each one in a little bit of detail, you just have to remember what we're looking at here. These are simply guidelines. This area of law is ultimately up to the judge on the day. That basically equates to judicial discretion and the court will have the ability to take into account all of these factors but it will ultimately be up to them on the day to decide whether or not the exemption clause is reasonable or not. They will look at other authorities to see how the courts have applied these factors, but they are ultimately just guidelines. So the first one is probably the most commonly cited, and that is the relative bargaining position of the parties. So on one hand, you might have a big mega international firm, and on the other, you might have a small little minnow of a supplier. If that multinational organisation is trying to impose via their standard terms some sort of really onerous exemption clause, the courts, because of the disparity in their bargaining position, the courts are more likely to find that that clause is unreasonable. When compared to two parties on a relatively equal footing who are trying to negotiate a contract. If both parties have a similar bargaining position, it's more likely than not that the courts will hold it to be reasonable. The next factor, was there any inducement to agree to the term? So if it was pointed out to one party and they increased their contract price as a result, so again, they were effectively taking on the risk and they priced that risk, then again, it's less likely to fall foul of the reasonableness test and is more likely to be enforceable. Did the customer know about the term? So again, if they did know about it and they still signed up to it, what do you think the answer would be? So again, it's less likely to fall foul of that test and it's more likely to be enforceable. Was it reasonable to expect compliance? Again, a bit more circular logic in there. But again, if it was reasonable to expect such a term within the contract, then again, more likely to be enforceable. And then lastly, where are the goods manufactured on special order? So this is a proper one-off piece of machinery or goods that are you know, not off the shelf. There may be the added ability to add in an exemption clause because of that specialist nature of the work. And again, they will take that into account when looking at the reasonableness test. You know, contrasting that to goods that are simple and off the shelf, but then you're adding in this big off the wall um, exemption clause. Why would you do that? It would be unreasonable to do so. So again, another factor that might be taken into account. So just to, to reiterate, these five factors, not one of them goes above and beyond the others. It's a five way balancing act. And ultimately they are just guidelines and it is up to the court to apply them to arrive at the decision as to whether or not an exemption clause is reasonable.